Welcome to the Next Level Casino Careers Show, a series highlighting industry tips and insights from the best minds in the casino and hospitality industry. Enjoy the show. Hello, Heather Jimenez. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, yes, my pleasure. And those tuning in who may not know Heather, she is our manager of professional development and internships with San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. Oh, my word, that's a mouthful, Heather. It's almost <laughs> as long as my title. Right? <laughs> um, Heather, for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about um, your origin story, where you grew up, your um, career interests, key stops along the way, so they can learn a little bit more about who you are and how you got where you are today? Absolutely. Um, I'm sure that my story resonates with a lot of different people, but I uh, grew up in a, a single parent household and I grew up a little bit of everywhere almost. I went to a bunch of different schools. I mostly was in the Inland Empire for uh, most of my childhood. So uh, you probably know me from Walnut, but you also probably know me from Pomona. You probably also know me from Ontario and all of those different kind of areas. So that's <laughs> that's just what happens, right, in, in single parent <laughs> households. Um, but it definitely uh, helped kind of shape who I am today to go to different schools in, in different areas and meet new people constantly. Uh, and then I got out of school, graduated high school, thought I was going to do the college route. Um, that didn't work out for me. That wasn't kind of the place that I want to be. And I realized that I really just wanted to go in and get a job. I wanted to kind of understand what it was like to, to work in, in all the different things. And of course, the first place I go to is retail which <laughs> kind of speaks for itself when a lot of people just jump right into retail and realize, oh my gosh, what have I done to myself? <laughs> um, but it was, it was a great learning experience. And from retail, I was able to land my first HR job and um, getting to experience that. So that was kind of my first introduction is like, let me try this. Nope, hate it. Let me try this. Nope, hate it. And now HR. I think I actually kind of like this. <laughs> well, nice. It's always good to hear stories like that because I can totally relate. I was a single mom um, for a large part of my older two's um, early childhood. Mm -hmm. So I, they were moving around schools and similar story. My daughter started off in retail and that's where she found out her right. niche. So just right. love how we have those um, similarities right there. As we yep. start today, we're already founding connections, right? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Why professional development and internship where you are today? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but you've been in the industry for 15 years, started off more in um, the uh, recruitment side of things, policies and procedures, and you know the learning and development's definitely a shift. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually, uh, my first HR job was working with my dad in uh, manufacturing. So he worked for a manufacturing company out in uh, Chino. Again, one of the many areas uh, around <laughs> which I was around, right? And then kind of grew up. Um, so in Chino, we were out there and I um, got my first request from our then HR director to help with payroll. And I was like, okay, I went from, copying manuals of how to like build things in this manufacturing world to helping with payroll stuff and it was new and different for me but i was always open to the challenge of like cool let me figure it out then so um i started with that payroll then it went to open enrollment for benefits and all kinds of things that was back in uh, 2006 which in my mind i'm like that's just a couple of years ago it's actually <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 17 years ago, it feels crazy um, to know that it kind of started there. But um, I got the opportunity to be able to work with different uh, companies, got to learn a lot of different facets of HR. I definitely did kind of the back of house side of things where it was behind the curtain, behind the scenes stuff. And that moved into recruitment. And for anybody who's looking into get into HR, instant gratification, you will absolutely get that from recruitment everyone is happy whenever you call them no matter what it's for right they see your number come up on their phone and they're so excited they see your email come through they're so excited to respond that's so true i never right. thought about that until you mentioned it right now but anytime yeah. i went for employment anywhere as soon as you get that call or that email from someone in recruitment it's automatically like positive like yeah no matter what kind of energy i bring which 
as you could probably already tell, I bring energy to most everything. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's what I do. Um, but like, no matter what kind of energy you bring, just the fact of who you are and what position you're coming from when you reach out to people, immediately it's so well received. And it was really nice to kind of experience that. I did a little bit of employee relations work in supporting um, some HR consultants that were kind of deep into the ER and um, labor relations type work. That is a different kind of satisfaction <laughs> that you get from that, right? That's a little bit more of a slow burn um, where it takes some time, but you know that you're doing good work, but it just takes a while to see those results. And then even getting into professional development today, I uh, actually first here at Seminole went into learning and development. It's kind of morphed into professional development. And why I really think that it was important for me to make that step was it's a little bit of both. I get that instant gratification when you're standing in front of a class and you have the light bulb moments that go off and make people really excited about what you have to talk about. And you have these group activities and great conversations. But then there's a lot of good work that happens kind of behind the scenes, that mm -hmm. slow burn work that happens where we can put out some surveys and ask questions and interview people and realize that we're actually making a true impact in what we do. So that's kind of why I landed where I'm at is that I really like both sides of those kinds of experiences that we can help bring to people and the right kind of energy, right? So I feel like I could do all of that and talk about it all day long, but that's how I got where I'm at now. <laughs> well, I think just knowing a little bit about you and you're sharing a little bit about your um, story and upbringing and how you got where you're at today. I also think being in learning and development gives you that diversity too. You're used to change and there's so many things that are changing within that dynamic, right? So absolutely. It's, yeah. It's I, I mean, since growing up, right? Like this is what my life was, was constant change and figuring out new ways to do things. And that's just what you have to deal with. And, and you move forward with that. And I, I enjoy that. I enjoy rapid changing environments for sure. So just pulling on that, I'm going to go two different directions. One, what does learning and development, a career in learning and development look like today for mm -hmm. you? And then um, I'm going to also ask you after that, like, what is the future of that based on just some things going on today? Sure, sure. So what it looks like for me, I think that it was really important to understand that things have changed since uh the, the advice that we've gotten from our parents, right? It was always this whole, like, you need to graduate college and then you need to do something. You right. need to have a plan, right? And it was like, usually it was go off to college. You need to go to college. You need to figure it out from there. And I recognize now in this role that there are a lot of people who went that path and they were successful at it. But it's this kind of idea that you go to college and then immediately jump into a career and you know what you're supposed to be doing by then. Right. I don't think that's the case. <laughs> no, you don't have that chance to kind of experiment because like exactly. me personally and some people that I know, they went, let's say, from finance to marketing. I went from probation to now I'm in the casino world, which I would have never imagined in communication. Right. right? right. I mean, <laughs> retail to making copies of manuals to doing HR work like this. I did not grow up thinking I was going to do human resources. <laughs> that is not the plan. Right. And no. I didn't even jump into school to do HR. That wasn't what I was trying to do either. At that time, I thought I was going to be a psychologist. Turns out not for me. So <laughs> <laughs> no thanks, actually. <laughs> well, I think you have to go through those life experiences and really um, understand yourself and what make, what drives you. Right. Exactly. Um, and I think even from that, um, it was important to understand that most of our leaders that we have in our businesses now kind of are facing the same thing, that maybe they did go to school and went that route and they had an opportunity to learn about giving a presentation and talking to people. But it's different when you're doing that in class, right, that you're giving a presentation to your peers in front of your professor versus giving a presentation to your executives and asking for buy-in to spend money or to invest in a project or a program. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there were some gaps that were happening there between those that went to school and went into a career, but also same with those that went straight into the career route, right, which is kind of the direction that I went, is that even going into the career route that I go in and I'm really good at uh, looking at payroll, right? I'm really good at recruitment where I can, you know, sell this job to anybody, but I didn't get those fundamentals of how do I have a difficult conversation with someone, especially right. as you go into a leadership role, right? Like how do I have a conversation with someone about attendance or mm -hmm. about their commitment and motivation and productivity? 
And I think that's where it's so important for teams like learning and development uh, and professional development to come in and be able to talk about how do we bridge those gaps between what you got from school and what you're doing at work and what you're doing at work and what you didn't get from school and, and meeting somewhere in the middle. No, definitely. Um, because while we do learn some of those things in school, you don't learn 100% how they apply till you're in the workforce. And then right. there's exactly. a lot of time to exactly. yeah. yeah. And I think that um, there's an opportunity for us to kind of bring forward some of those kinds of things in, in these development classes that we create or programs and things like that that we do. We also look at, you know, different research that we could do and some um, videos and articles and books that help leaders kind of meet in that middle. And sometimes L&D is just there to facilitate a conversation and right. just help understand what it is that we're reading and, and have the conversation around it so that way it can make sense for us. So no, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as we're looking into the future um, in the second half of 2023 and beyond, just with the changes in the landscape from just AI to um, just the, the information we have at our fingertips, how do you see professional development um, continuing to evolve within that? Yeah, I think AI is really, really cool and also really, really scary right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's so many things that can happen with the AI. And it's really nice to have this kind of, uh, I've kind of like tinkered with the chat GPT thing, right? And just to see like what things come up. And it's really interesting to have that. But it's always important, especially I think when you come from an HR background of the human component of all of mm -hmm. this, right? And when we think about trends in the future of professional development, it's less about the actual content that's being created. So I can ask an AI to write a course for me, but it's mm -hmm. more so about the delivery, right? And what methods do we bring this information to people? And what ways do we communicate with people that will help them understand, to help them feel like they're connected to what we are bringing? And I think that that's what's so important, that we can look at any trends that are happening. We know diversity and inclusion is a huge trend, right? We know that um, generational leadership is a huge trend, but but really it's how are we communicating with folks and how do we help when I talk about those gaps between those that went the career route versus the school route, those kinds of things is that in, in general, overall, we know that communication is key. So what type of delivery methods can we bring and how do we figure out exactly what people need from us that our clients are those groups that we're working with? How do we bring that information back to us by talking to them? and mm -hmm. understanding what they need. And that's something that AI can't do, right? AI is not going out to go talk to our folks and it's really up to us. That's that human component that kind of comes in at that point. No, I 100% agree because I think that those environments that we create um, foster collaboration. They make sure that we're aligned with whatever we're doing within our own departments as an organization as a whole. And then they just enable you to be able to network, right? You learn those basic communication skills so you can continue right. to build that support right. system. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And they also challenge us to think outside the box, which I want to talk about a little bit too. Um, how do you continue to create new and innovative and fun ways of learning outside of the box? And how do you um, encourage your teams to do the same? It's really about just kind of being curious, right? And, and questioning everything that's around you and not questioning in a, in a point of, um, being accusatory or defensive or anything like that. But it's really about just being able to be curious and understand different backgrounds, motivations, or other things that can help get you to a place that of understanding, right? And that collaboration and alignment, all of that happens by, by being curious. So that's really what I encourage my team to do as well is go out and ask questions, go talk to people, go uh, find different ways of doing things than, mm -hmm. than what we're probably traditionally used to and sometimes it's a little bit scary to to think about that because we operated in the same way constantly and then all of a sudden you're asking me to change but in right. that change really brings out creativity and and finding those different ways the different methods that we could use to help make sure that we are successful and that we are also still aligned with whatever's happening and changing in the business because we can definitely find ourselves in a place where we're out of touch and right. then we have to figure out how we can back in tune with everything that's happening in the business. 
No, definitely. Or you just get so busy, especially here, we're 24 seven. And, you know, there might be some other people tuning in their operations are 24 seven and you just get caught in the everyday and everything becomes right. a routine. And it's like, you want to switch it up, keep people excited, keep people engaged. And so just thinking outside the box, being creative, brainstorming with your team is just different avenues that we can make sure we continue to do so. Right. And speaking, Absolutely. Of, and speaking of curiosity, by the way, um, we have internship programs here, but just in general, um, for folks that maybe they're, if they're in school and their major doesn't require internship, but they're debating doing one, what is the value and benefits of um, participating in internship, but both from um, the participant side and maybe um, someone who's leading an internship program? Yeah, I think that internships are kind of going back to what my philosophy was from the very beginning is try try everything, right? Try everything once. And an internship really is about having an opportunity to go in and try something new without fully committing to it or feeling like you're stuck. And it gives you a chance to get a peek under the tent to see, is this something that I'd really want to do? Or maybe it's not, right? I don't want to be a psychologist anymore. And if I would have done an internship, I would have realized that. Luckily, I had some other kind of ways to figure that out on my own uh, through school. But um, that's really what it's about. And I really, really encourage students to find ways to do that. Not every school offers those, but there are absolutely community groups that we've worked with in the past to be able to help um, a school come up with an internship program or an apprenticeship, as mm -hmm. well as um, companies that they work with directly. So things like uh, Tomorrow's Talent is one that we actively uh, use, and they are groups that work with the school and with the community or uh, company partner to be able to figure out how can we get your students aligned with this. They also come in and talk to the company leaders to figure out what exactly are you wanting students to come out of school knowing so that way we can work with the school to make sure that they're being taught those kinds of things. And I think it really just helps take the guesswork out of anything for students, for the business, things like that. Um, but I highly, highly encourage people to think about that and figure out ways that they can just have a taste, right? Like just have a taste of something, see if it's something you want to do. Maybe you haven't found your passion for today, if you even find your passion, right, at any right. point. But it's still important to know that you've, you've tried it, you like it, you don't, you want to continue down that path and you just get to see what it looks like for the future for yourself. No, definitely. Before you make a huge commitment that you regret later, right? Right, exactly. And you spend a lot of time and then you're like, I've wasted all these years, right? And it's yeah. not about that. It's that you've taken that and you've learned and met people along the way um, that will help you get into that next point. But an internship, you get to do it early on. You get to do it while you're still finding yourself. No, and another part of it is like you went the HR route. Maybe mm -hmm. if you went to an internship, you would have found exactly where your niche was in HR earlier than you did, right? So exactly. there's a different, you might be going the right direction, but it helps you find your specialty maybe within that. Yeah, area. absolutely. <laughs> because, <laughs> in other words, um, yeah, because I, you kind of, a lot of times we just fall into these different things, right? Like mm -hmm. I fell into doing payroll things. I fell into, um, you know, having uh, these recruitment opportunities or, you know, writing up a corrective action and those kinds of things. But it would be nice to say, like, let me learn a little bit about each one and figure out exactly where I want to go. And instead of going down this career path and realizing, oh, no, now I'm stuck. And now what do I do? Right. Like, do I have to go backwards? Which absolutely go backwards. You got to go backwards, go backwards, diagonal, sideways, all yeah. of the things. Right. But that if you could do that early on to kind of figure that out for yourself and map it out for yourself do it, have a plan. And you know what, if you got to blow it up, you blow it up. And that's okay. Right. Too. I love it. And then I, a different, so I didn't have the personal experience with internships, but another avenue that I felt, um, no matter where I was at my, in my career, whether 20s, 30s, 40s, um, was the value of mentorships, both, um, having a mentor and then being a mentor. Can you talk to us a little bit about, um, both sides of that, the finding a mentor, like why that's valuable, how to go about finding one. And then I'll have, We'll dive a little bit more into being a mentor later too. Yeah, I think that when we talk about finding these kinds of areas and and figure out what you're interested in, it's so important to have a mentor that will guide you along the way. That's really what a mentor is for, right? Is to help guide you and mm -hmm. you know somebody you can ask the hard questions to, somebody who's kind of already in it, and you could say like, is this like how did you get here? And is this something that you really enjoy doing? What parts of it? So that way I could see if there's any kind of connection that I could make. 
uh, mentorships come in very various different forms, right? Like there could be a formal program that's put together by the business to, to be able to have this mentorship opportunity, or uh, sometimes it just comes organically, right? It's that, especially like for me, I've noticed that most of the leaders that I've worked for have been great mentors as well, and that they've come in to be able to say like, hey, let me guide you in different ways. It's really about being able to connect with someone and have that time that you set aside to communicate with them to say this is what i'm thinking about doing what do you think about that or tell me a little bit more about yourself to see if that's something that i'd be interested in and mm -hmm. and letting this organic conversation flow but it's so important to figure out who are the right mentors who is who's going to lead you in the right direction also right or who's mm -hmm. going to challenge you a little bit and and not make this easy for you who's going to make sure that you feel supported that you feel heard but also is going to make you do some tough things or make some tough decisions and and help be there as your guiding light while you do those things. And what about on the flip side of it? I feel like um, being a mentor is a, a way of teaching and developing our future leaders, right? So can you talk to us a little bit about, um, about that? And for those folks that may be a little bit hesitant on whether they have the qualities to be a good mentor, um, how, you know, you can kind of elevate your style of teaching um, to match with your future leaders um, being successful? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the number one thing is relatability, right? I think that sometimes for people who are looking for a mentor, it's intimidating when you see somebody who has a list of several degrees behind their name, or they run very large organizations that you're like, mm -hmm. maybe this, I, this person I probably can't relate to, but here we are, you and I both coming from, you know, single parent homes or being a single mom and understanding those kinds of things. Relatability is so important. So never feel like you have that kind of imposter syndrome. Although I say never feel, but that doesn't stop someone from feeling that, right? right. Is that knowing that you're not good enough, right? To be a mentor, that being relatable enough is just so helpful for other people to see that there is an opportunity and working through that opportunity. Also, it's really important that as a mentor, you are committing to your promises, right? And that you are not just saying things just to say things because they sound mm -hmm. nice, but if I say I'm going to help guide you and I'm going to meet with you next week, you need to meet next week. And it's so important for the person, the mentee, to be able to say, I know that I can count on this person because they've been there for me, as opposed to these open-ended promises. So it's almost taking a hard look at your schedule and figuring out, mm -hmm. can I commit to this? But also knowing that you are in a right position, you are the right type of person to do this. You just need to commit. Yeah, definitely. Because you want to um, create that trust and you have to commit and then hold true to your word to build that trust, right? So that you're having open, honest dialogue and Absolutely. making your mentee feel comfortable on sharing their ideas and thoughts that they may be uncertain about, right? Um, so yeah, definitely. Yep. And absolutely changing directions a little bit. How can one um, either individually or as an organization ensure that their courses align with current best practices? I think that um, it's important to think about your connection to people. And it's kind of a little bit what I was talking about before is, is figuring out how does the delivery need to change? What types of communication methods are we going to use? But, but really connecting with others and, and kind of, it actually kind of plays into a little bit about the mentorship, right? Opportunities, things like that is that, are you willing to commit to something? Are you building that trust? Are you aligning with what the values are of the organization with the leadership, right? Because those two might not be the same, um, but all of that comes down to connecting with other people. Uh, we're always looking at some industry trends, but it's also, really important to know that you are unique, right? Every organization that you work for is unique in its own way. I know that I can speak specifically for Samuel. Well, we're unique that one, it's gaming, right? There is gaming operations that's revenue generating. But for us in HR, we're actually a shared service to tribal government operations. So our overall goal is to support a tribal nation. Mm -hmm. And so that makes us unique as well, right? That we don't just have a an executive group, an executive leadership team to report to, but we also have a tribal council and a tribal nation, tribal citizens that we also want to be able to report to and be able to show that we are holding every value and um, 
all of those kinds of important things for them sacred, right? We want to make sure that we are holding true to that, but we also have the revenue generating side of the business that we also have to support. And so I know that I need to connect to those best practices by finding uniqueness and all of that work that we do and providing unique opportunities for those two different groups, right? And so Maybe it's some things that there are some other gaming institutions that are, are doing that work really well. Maybe there's some other tribal nations that are doing something really well and we can combine the two to find a, a middle ground. That's how we find our best practices and how to make sure that we keep those courses aligned is just connecting with the people that that are kind of influencing those two different sides to make mm -hmm. sure that we feel like what we have are connecting as well. No, definitely. And I think you guys do a good job of doing that and all that play is a key component in creating the culture that we have here. And that's another way of us being unique, right? Is just our team and familial culture and, yep. um, and really investing in our teams and genuinely caring. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, speaking a little bit about, we talked earlier about being either single moms or in a single family household. Um, so I know for me personally, sometimes I didn't feel I've had time to do some of the things that I wanted to do, like go back to school. What would you say to people that feel like they can't carve out the time to take those classes or commit themselves 100 percent? Yeah, I 1000 percent resonate with that. Um, so my um, I, my husband and I have been married for 17 years and um, thank you. And he was in the Marine Corps, so he was deployed quite often, which um, for those that um, understand the military wife lifestyle, then it does feel like you're the single parent for a little bit, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. um, you're kind of running the household at the same time. And I had two little boys at home that I had to take care of. But at the same time, I was absolutely invested in my career and figuring out ways that I could move that forward, right? Because I, I wanted that for myself. So definitely had to figure out how do I juggle being a mom, number one, first priority and everything. I'm a mom of two small children, but right. I also had a great job that I wanted to do well at. And I was also going to school. It's a lot, right? I'm also the soccer mom. So it's like, oh, gosh, please, nice. no, yeah, like, please get all of your, your cleats, your shin guards, the ball, your water, yeah. all of those things ready to go in the car. But I also got to make sure I have my backpack ready to go so I can go to school. And I got to figure out dinner because I'm not going to even be home for dinner during this time. I got to figure out mm -hmm. some other alternatives. So 100% understand the struggle. Um, I think the biggest thing is understanding one, it's never too late to figure out what your next step is, whether it's continuing education and, and doing all of that. I had some great examples in my family. My mother actually graduated with her bachelor's degree from University of Oregon at 58 years old. She had a whole career and was working, you know, call centers and all these things and was like, you know what, time out. I don't want to do this anymore. And at 58, she went in, she got her degree. She ended up being the commencement speaker for her graduating class. Oh, nice. Super cool to come and, and be able to see that happen. But that was like a really cool lesson for me is like, it's okay that I didn't go directly from high school into college. I ended up having a whole life happen, right? I had kids, yeah. I had all of these other responsibilities, but I was able to find some time because I knew that that was what was driving me forward was that I wanted something for myself. Right. right. It was about the self-identity. I was mom. I was wife. I was the soccer coach, soccer ref. All of these mm -hmm. soccer took over my world. Still does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. Right. And so I was all of those things, but I couldn't find like who's Heather. Mm -hmm. And and I knew that part of that meant that I needed to go back to school. I needed to level up in different ways. Right. For my own career, for my own self and just figure out how do I do that? So number one definitely never too late to do those kinds of things and finding that time take the risks figure out what you need to do to put yourself out there it's scary right to kind of how i mentioned before about asking the team about think about different ways i had disrupt my whole schedule and my whole life to figure out how can i fit this in but sometimes it takes blowing it up to figure out what do i need to do next yep and also take breaks because there's a lot of times people will tell you, don't stop going to school. If you don't, if you stop, you're never going to go back. It's never going to, it's taken me probably maybe four, no, maybe 12, 12 to 14 years to get my bachelor's degree. Uh, it's a really long time, <laughs> but that's because in between. And it, it's important to know 
that even life happening, I could still make time for these kinds of things to happen. I just needed to take a break. It's okay to set the pencil down for a second, rethink everything and come right back to it, knowing that you still can go back to it, but it's still not too late to come back. No, I took a 15 year break. So I was determined to do my master's and um, got it done before I turned 40. Um, but I think, you know, part of it is finding that self identity and then also um, setting that example, whether it's for your children or your team that looks up to you, whomever it may be, right? You're, you're being that motivation for others at the same time as well. So if that's something that pulls you, um, that is another reward of, you know, no matter where you are, when you're doing things, you're not only making an impact in your own life, you're making an impact in others, whether you realize it or not. So, um, shifting exactly. gears just a little bit. And I think it goes oh, back to our conversation about mentorship as well. Sorry. <laughs> it goes back to our conversation about mentorship a little bit too, right? Like all of these things make you relatable as a person. Like mm -hmm. you didn't have to go immediately into this four year college and get your degree, your master's and all of these other things that come afterwards that, it's okay to take breaks and then still be relatable to somebody that also needed to take a break. You're still kind of useful in that aspect to, to pull on for these experiences. No, definitely. And another thing I was going to say is you mentioned risks. Like for me, I didn't have to, yeah. I work through my bachelor's, right? So I didn't have debt and I didn't want to do my master's until I could fully pay for it. And then I finally realized I'm just going to do it. Like I will end up figuring out how to pay it off. And, you know, I will, it, I will make sure that I continue to move up and support my family however I can. And whether I have to pay debt for a little bit, so be it. And I mean, it worked itself out, but it is a risk take you take, especially when you have kids and, you know, you kind of have all these financial responsibilities, whether it's soccer or, um, you know, sport, like just sports or traveling or whatever you're trying to do with your kids, you know, at the end of the day, um, education is the risk worth taking um, to continue to better ourselves. And absolutely speaking of, bettering ourselves. Um, what is the benefits of continuous learning um, that you would advise that you would give to others, what, no matter where you are in your career, whether you're already an established leader, uh, what, why should you continue to um, evolve in your learning? If that, uh, because uh, we don't, we don't, <laughs> yeah, no, totally. <laughs> yes. Um, we don't know everything, right? We think that we do, and maybe we do in our small little worlds that we kind of put our focus into, but then that creates that tunnel vision. Uh, mm -hmm. There are definitely some very smart people out there that have figured out new and different ways. And you're probably also one of those smart people that right that figure out new and different ways of doing things. And it's it's OK to learn from those people and know be be a little bit humble. Right. Like that there is mm -hmm. an opportunity to, to learn from others and learn from others mistakes or learn from other successes, whatever that looks like. Um, it's it's even if it isn't anything formal where you're going in to take a class, right? Just having a chance to put yourself in front of someone to have a conversation about different ways that they do things and then mapping it out for yourself, that's still continuous learning. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that there's so many other avenues other than a an institution at a, at a four year school, right? Or whatever that looks like, technical school, any of those kinds of things, but there's also learning that can happen peer to peer learning. Um, mm -hmm. That's still learning. And so, uh, taking the time out to do that and being receptive to information that you're hearing and figuring out how you can support that person who is also very creative that maybe when you don't have it that person is and then you can lean on them for that kind of learning that you might have and just taking on that a little bit more i also think that um like within organizations you mentioned earlier um just having difficult conversations is uh some teaches classes that we teach right i think that sometimes it's important to, if you've taken those like a long time ago, still to take them again, like either yes. online or in person. So for organizations to have those resources for folks to kind of brush up on skills that they may feel like they already have, but they need a refresher course, right? So it's not like you mentioned, it's not just about going back to school. There's uh, so many different ways to keep uh, up with learning and growing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I even think about for myself, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm comfortable enough to stand in front of a classroom and, and talk about a topic, right? Or for us to have a conversation about right. something, but then someone challenges you slightly different. As an example, um, here at Sam and Well, we have Toastmasters mm -hmm. and we were going through Toastmasters and I was like kind of called upon where they do this like, you know, spontaneous challenge of like, you get called upon, you have to answer these questions. 
and immediately fumbled. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was like, I've done this for so long. I could talk to anybody and uh, I could sell ice to an Eskimo, right? That kind of thing. Like all of these ideas of like, I think that I could do this. And then it, it just takes somebody else to ask a question. And I was like, oh, maybe I don't. I need to go mm -hmm. back in and practice this a little bit more. Um, so again, it's about being humble and figuring out different ways to do things than you used to do it or just to get that refresher, right? And and realize that there are probably some new cool techniques that you didn't get when you learned it 15 years ago. Speaking of 15 years ago, and I know you've been in, in your field for a, a while now, um, what are some lessons you've learned along the way that you apply today? I know you probably touched on a few, uh, but I specifically wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah. I think that, uh, so earlier I was kind of talking about like never too late to all those things, but I think that um, thinking about some tips that I would give to people, right? Some some tips in, in how I would suggest for them to, to be successful or to think about different ways that they could do things is it's really important to get out there and talk to people. It's important to network with folks, whether it's finding your mentor, finding a mentee, or finding ways to learn from other creative folks. It's just so important to get out of your office mm -hmm. and actually go talk to people. And this isn't by giving surveys, right? Like there's absolutely a survey fatigue that can happen when you mm -hmm. survey all the people that you work with over and over and over, just go out and have a conversation and, and figure out about a person, right? Learn about a person and figure out what the interests them, what motivates them. And from that, you kind of get a lot of cool ideas that, that stem from this conversation. Um, I'd also recommend having a plan. Earlier I talked about, you know, being accountable and, you know, sticking to your commitments, have a plan that makes it a lot easier to then commit to something and then deliver on that promise. Um, but it's important to, to figure out where that plan starts and then where it should end and use resources during that whole time, right? Figure out who you need to talk to to get to the end goal in that plan. So that's, that's kind of my advice that I would give, um, if I were younger, uh, Again, I would I would do that advice or to anybody else that's kind of thinking about, you know, what this could look like for them in a career or in any other kind of opportunities. Really, this kind of applies anywhere. Get out yeah. and come up with a plan and execute. So coming up with a plan and executing, what is the power of thinking big? The power of thinking big is really for me about um, thinking outside of yourself, right? Uh, this actually kind of reflects a little bit of on a, a quote that I really like from Maya Angelou, but it's about, it's not about, people won't remember the things that you said, they'll remember how you made them feel. And mm -hmm. I really resonate with that because when I think about my career, especially going into that recruitment, right, the instant gratification of like, things are great, is that I made people feel good. I made people really happy with just a phone call, with a, a an email, things like that. Um, and I want to make sure that I continue to leave that lasting impression on people to, to understand people. So it's for me, thinking big is thinking outside of myself and thinking about how I impact other people. So it's funny you mentioned that because the way you impacted me and helped me to build a connection um, was um, we did this SDI personality test. And that made me understand um, a little bit more about my peers and how they communicate, why they do some of the things that they do. Can you talk to us a little about, about the SDI personality test and approach it in a way some of our listeners may not know what it is and the value within it? Absolutely. I am a huge, huge fan of the SDI. So SDI is a core strengths. It's SDI stands for the Strengths Deployment Inventory for anybody who doesn't know. And it's this assessment that you could take and we know that there are several assessments that are out there, but this assessment in particular really looks at your motivational value system as well as your conflict sequence. So when things are going well, but also when things are not going the way that you plan for it to go. Uh, so it's a really cool assessment that looks at both of those things. It also looks at the strengths that you bring to your ta to the table. So uh, for people who've done like Clifton Strengths Finder, it kind of ties in a little bit of that, but it also talks about how you present yourself to the people that are around you how people see you, and also how you prioritize those types of strengths, and also the things that you avoid because it's not so fun, right? Uh, so I'm mm -hmm. a huge, huge fan of core strengths and SDI. Um, so my particular result that I have is I'm a red blue, and that kind of actually helps me with the think big is that I realize now that as much as I started my career in this like kind of like process-driven point, 
that I, it's not that I'm motivated by process. I'm actually motivated by helping people and by performance, right? So the red blue is, is related to those things, people and performance, is that I want people to feel connected with what I have to share, but I also wanna get us across the finish line. Mm -hmm. And finding ways that I can connect the two is, is super, super fun to me. That's how I'm engaged. If you want me to be bought into any project, tell me how it's going to help a certain group of people and also tell me how it's going to bring results in some kind of way. Um, so I, I advocate for people to take that as much as they can it also is a really cool way of looking at um, how you can communicate with other folks. So, right. So I know enough about you to be able to say, right. Cause you're a blue people person. Yeah. <laughs> I know that if I want to talk to you about something, we're going to talk about how this makes a difference. I'm right. going to talk about how to protect other people and how to make sure people feel heard, how people um, will be uh, engaged and motivated to do something you care about at the end of the day about people. Right. And anyone who isn't people driven isn't that they don't care about people. It's just that that motivation lies somewhere else. Maybe for me in the performance side or anybody else who's that red kind of MBS is that it's about getting across the finish line. How do we get there? How do we make sure that we bring everybody on my back to get across that finish line together? Right. Yeah. And so communication comes in is that I know that some of my executive leadership team are reds. So when I'm talking to them, I maybe want to just talk directly about here are the results that we're going to get to, and I'm going to have this to you by the end of the month. That's mm -hmm. what they need to know from me. That has really made me successful in my career because that's how I know that I can have them bought into any of these crazy plans and programs that I try to bring to them, <laughs> right? But also how I can make sure that they're invested in the work that we do in learning and development and professional development as well. No, definitely. I feel like um, it helped me because, you know, some of my leaders are red. Um, right. Some of my colleagues are blue. And it just helped me to um, communicate better and then just understand their approach on things overall. So Absolutely. I just highly recommend it. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> and talking about me being a people person, I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit more about Heather and learn a little bit more about Heather. Um, so I know you're, you know, we're 24 seven, you're constantly busy. What do you do to disconnect? Um, what are your hobbies so that when you come back to work, you're energized and bring 100% your best self? So um, my hobby might be a little bit unique to some. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm like really interested now to hear what this is. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> um, so I actually play roller derby. So um, I play roller derby on the side on, oh, wow. uh, yeah, at night and on the weekends. So I have a team that I play with and it's actually, it's almost challenged me a little bit, right? Is that I've challenged me physically, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I <did> not <laughs> before that, I rollerbladed as a child at like birthday parties, right? Skate Express, like that's where we were at. But roller skating was not my thing. I went and learned how to roller skate with this team I met so many other unique people that actually find out that they are very similar to me, mostly moms that, you know, everywhere from a scientist to doctors to teachers to all kinds of different career paths that are happening there within a roller derby team. But it is such a good way to disconnect and relate to other people, right? This is kind of thinking about like, what is the identity of Heather? Uh, mm -hmm. And what I can bring is that I want to make sure that people know that I have the ability to kind of be a chameleon in different ways. And some of times that can get exhausting. Going mm -hmm. into roller derby, I talk to people who are very similar to me and we just tune everything else out and play the game. And it's a lot of, a lot of hard hitting <laughs> things that are happening, but it's so much different than going to the gym, right? At the gym, oh, yeah. I got my hands on and I'm thinking about what I got to make for dinner tonight, right? Or when's the next kid's game that I got to make sure I plan accordingly and leave work on time to get to the game. Instead, in roller derby, all I can think about is what's happening on the track, thinking about the skates on my feet, my teammates around me. And it's just such a good way to kind of just tune everything else out and then hit that reset button. So I come back fresh with new ideas, with, with a new kind of sense of, of who I am and what I can bring and help the team move forward in that kind of thinking as well is stepping out of the box. And roller derby is definitely an out of the box hobby to have. I was um, gonna say it's very it's definitely you talked about uniqueness earlier. It's definitely a unique way. <laughs> that is a unique way. Yeah. I could have been painting, but I'm not a great painter. Uh, <laughs> so here so here we are. <laughs> um so in doing that sport, you challenge yourself. Um in that aspect, but how are some other ways that you challenge yourself every day? 
I am just finding new ways, right? Like to do things that even outside of roller derby, there's other cool, unique hobbies and things that you can you can do. Uh, another good example of that I've seen um, that's pretty unique is that my director actually runs a, um, a training program that she does for guide dogs. And she's used a lot of that in the work that she does here as far as learning and development and working in employee relations kind of area. I do the same with roller derby is going in and I challenge myself to talk to other people, figure out different ways to do things. I also uh, I'm a trainer for that roller derby team. So I think about training plans and I end up using a lot of that skill as transferable into the work that I do here. And knowing that if I continuously challenge myself in these kinds of unique opportunities, there's a way to relate it back somehow or just kind of growing as a person. So um, thinking about different ways to think about things or different personality types to work with and bringing all of that to the workplace really kind of keeps us on our toes and um, and challenges the team to think about different ways to do things, challenges our executives to think about different ways to do things, all of that. I don't know if that really answered the question, but- No, it did. I'm here for the challenge. <laughs> okay, a favorite book or a movie? Uh, favorite book, um, right now I've been reading uh, The Leadership Pipeline um that is a book that i really like because it talks a lot about career mapping and thinking about what it means to become the next level of leader um thinking specifically about what are some things that you have to let go as you start to move up in your career ladder um a lot of times what ends up happening is that you have leaders who are really really good at something and it gets them that progression into the next level and they want to hold on to those things that they're really really good at that it doesn't allow for them to challenge themselves and think differently to go into the next level and think a little bit more strategically. And so that's what I like about this book is it talks about how do you break those barriers and let go of some of those things so that way you are ready to move into the next. Love it. Mm -hmm. So before I ask our famous final question, is there anything additional um, that you we haven't touched on either professionally or personally that you'd like to um, share today? I think that um, it's important to remember that, and I think this has kind of been the, the mantra that I've had throughout all the, all the stories that I've shared so far, is it's just trying everything, right? It's about taking that risk. Um, so I really want to challenge other leaders and um, other businesses, organizations, groups, whatever it is, to to take risks and think about doing things differently than you have before. I think it's so important to find ways to connect with the community not only the community within the business and the team members that you have, but also the community that are around you and, and figure out how you can help support them. That kind of ties into internships a little bit as well, is thinking about how can you bring that community on board? Because I know that the work that everybody's doing is really good work, but how do you share that message with other people and it's bringing people on board and taking that risk to let people in? Mm -hmm. Like it. All right, our, last fam our famous last question. Three tips um, someone can start implementing right now to take their career to the next level. Um, this is probably repetitive, but it's get out of your office, right? Stop emailing people to ask questions. Stop, um, you know, thinking that everything happens here in this small room. Get out, go talk to people, get to know them figure out what stuff that they can bring to the table. And maybe this is really me as the red blue person, right? In my <laughs> core strengths is get to know people and understand how they can help you. And that can start today. I, sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming to think about, you know, what can I do and what plan do I put together? How do I get there? But really if it starts with you just getting up out of the office, go say hi to folks, walk down mm -hmm. the hallway, go say hi, see how they're doing, ask about their families, make that connection with people. It makes you more approachable. And when you're more approachable, people will come share ideas with you. And that's really what we want, right? Is that all the ideas don't have to come from me. I don't need to be the creative keeper of all the things, right? Is that if I'm approachable and I get out of my office and kind of talk to people, definitely those ideas will come flowing in and I will be so happy to be the champion, the cheerleader, whatever you need me to do to to help see those ideas come to life so number one get out talk to folks agree mm -hmm. that's, uh, one. that's one. one and like, three <laughs> two and three <laughs> 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 just <do> one <laughs> maybe <laughs> later 
look at this uniqueness that's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> you do have any other any other no, other second third tips? No, I think you do. <laughs> oh. I, I'm going to give her two number two. I okay. think number two for you would be um, when you commit to something. You can start committing to things now and just make sure you 100% um, stay true to what you commit to. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. So even if we think about, uh, okay, there is that was a good number two. Um, and then you're going to think of a number three while you're answering the number two. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is that um, is, is when you are going out to be able to talk to people, and if you are going to make a promise on something, keep it, right? Or don't commit to anything. If that's what it is, then don't commit. Um, right. Because at the end of the day, people are going to wonder like, hey, I mentioned this and they said that they were going to make this happen. And then that's where that trust kind of breaks down. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely, if you're going to commit to anything, commit to it, have an end goal. Um, I also don't want people to, to fall into that trap of not committing to anything, right, for fear of commitment. So right. there's got to be something, maybe this is our number three, um, <laughs> that you actually do make a commitment to, right? you got to figure out what am I trying to achieve at the end of the day? Um, and and whether it's in a big picture, right? How do I help bring in more profit? How do I help make sure that we are relatable or whatever that kind of end goal is? Maybe it isn't a big end goal. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's very small of, of I just need to go and talk to this one person. But whatever it is, find a goal, commit to that one thing and take those baby steps, right? It's kind of like what we were talking about before with going back to school is that it's a little bit overwhelming to think like, I need to get my bachelor's degree in four years or whatever it is. That's not it, right? The first thing is, is I'm going to find a school that I want to go to. That by itself, a lot of work, right? Mm -hmm. But then going in and I'm making, uh, filling out an application, done. Set small goals for yourself so that way it's easier to commit to. And then make sure that you deliver on that promise for yourself. So that way you can actually achieve those results. So I think you hit on your two and three. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Look at us working together so well. <laughs> well, thank you, Heather. It's really been um, an enjoyable. Ugh, I can't talk. Enjoyable time with you today. I look forward to chatting with you soon, and I hope that everybody that was tuning in got some great value from this conversation. Go ahead and please check us out on LinkedIn. Follow us on um, Next Level Casino Careers page so that you can keep up with the latest and greatest that we have um, going on. And have a great rest of the day, Heather. Thank you so much, Serena. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. Check out more episodes on nextlevelcasinocareers.com.